Dude, what were you getting paid that first help desk gig? That was paying me 25 an hour. Like, how did you even find out about me? And I started watching some YouTube videos. I'm like, you know what? So I want to see what's going on. At this time, I was interviewing a lot, uh, higher level roles. And then it was at the point where I see that there was some knowledge gaps there. But at the same time, I always got told that you don't have to know everything to get land a, a job. But I think after that is when you hit me up like, yo, I... I landed the, the gig at the startup. So the startup was called Share. It was a car sharing company. And I hit you up like the same day they gave me the offer. What the startup offered you just for you to leave? Uh, the startup, it was offering 80. So that's a 30K jump. <laughs> so, you know, I took that to the manager. I'm like, hey, I I know this probably a long <laughs> shot, but I might as well ask. Can y'all match this? I'm like, oh, no, nah, brother, you making what well, my manager's here making now. Nah. Wish me well and say, hey, you got to take that. So, I, couldn't be, I wouldn't be mad at you for taking that. Right, and I bet once they found out you was leaving, everybody started trying to see, well, what you know how to do? And this yeah. and that. And I, I'm trying to leave the help desk too. I want to make $80,000. And every podcast, I talk about how in real life and not on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, people is not making more than $80,000. You got people that's making forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. 80000 is a lot to them. So... Stay out social media, keep your head down, and just try to elevate your life some type of way because people will be happy to get that money. This video is being sponsored by Level Up in Tech. Are you interested in starting a career in cloud computing? The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that between 2021 and 2031, cloud computing jobs will increase by 15%. LinkedIn is also showing 170K plus roles related to the cloud that are currently open now. Also, the average cloud engineer salary is 132000 Now, you may be sitting there asking yourself, hmm, I want to make $132,000. How do I get into the cloud? Well, Level Open Tech has got you covered. Level Open Tech is a 24-week comprehensive program dedicated to helping you land a cloud role. It will show you everything you need to know related to the cloud. They also have coaches that can guide you and ways on how to help you interview better. Love Up and Tech has helped many people start their cloud career and they have so many testimonials on their website. So if you're interested in starting your cloud career, use my link that'll be in the description. But welcome back to the Textual Talk Podcast. I'm your host, HD. This is episode 112. And we got another banger for you, man. We got my boy from Memphis, Maine. You know what I'm saying? Lee Clayton <laughs> of the Clay Talk Show. He coming to rock with us. Me and him argue all the time through text and phone. So I figured let me just bring somebody who don't agree with the stuff I'm saying on the pod so it's not gonna be like the traditional pods he's gonna do the intro and introduce itself but then we're just gonna start talking about what we always talk about because it's funny because i think we're i think we represent two different places in our careers and so that's why we see things pretty much differently which is pretty cool but if you're watching this on youtube right now you know what to do subscribe hit the bell icon click on all so you can be notified when i'm dropping all content and if you're listening on apple Podcasts, spotify google Podcasts, or any other streaming service Please follow us, download the podcast, share it out, leave a review. Really helps us out in the um, podcast algorithm. But without further ado, it's Mr. Lee Clayton. What's up with you, man? <laughs> yeah, what's going on, <laughs> man? <laughs> man, it's been a long time coming. You know what's funny? I actually want to tell like a funny story, like how I met Lee. Lee is like technically, I guess you can say like a mentee, but not really because he don't really ask me stuff. He's like, man, look at this. He'll always just tell me to check something out, but. Ideally, Lee and I had a consultation. It was like the middle of the year. Very beginning of this year. It was the beginning of this year. He wanted to be cheap, though. He didn't want to get no resume or nothing. <laughs> well, you know. But uh, he did end up landing a startup. But we kept on talking after then. And I, and I talk to people all the time. Like, just because you don't get service with me don't mean I'm just going to block you and not talk to you. Because <laughs> that's not really my idea. Like, do I want to make some money? Yeah. But I'm not in it for the money. Like, I had a client last night. Well, not a consultation, hour long consultation. And he was asking me about when I was opening up coaching for clients again. I told him maybe February or, or March so I can make sure I give them the right amount of time. And I'll just explain them how I do stuff. And I was like, I make uh, the group coaching with the Loom videos and everything else. And he was just like, well, you know, can I just do the coaching and get the videos? I was like, if I wanted to just get the money out of you, sure. But I was like, I want you to get value out of it. And so I know he'll probably come back because I, I could have stuck him up. I could have got the, the $700 and he could have just got the videos and went on his way. But I don't think that's going to be as beneficial as him getting a one-on-one -on -one time with me. So yep. if y'all do need some coaching, y'all can get at me or 
Y'all need a resume done. Y'all can get at me. And now shout out uh, Christy over there is on the ones and twos. She's helping us out today. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So it's a, it's a good day. It's Saturday evening. We got Lee out here. My boy is he. I don't know if y'all heard the intro to the to the pod, but uh, you know it's new chapters in life. New chapters for everything. Yeah. But without further ado, can you go ahead and introduce yourself to the listeners and the viewers? Well, yep. Yeah, so <clears throat> I said most of it already. I'm Lee Clayton. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. So made that very known. Um. Background was military, did some military work uh, for a few years, about one enlistment for four years. And now I've uh, been doing work, cybersecurity work for a, a defensive contractor. And yeah, just like to stay abreast into the new technologies and just meet new people. Like I met this guy right here. Man, that's, <laughs> not, that's not how this man really talked, but... <laughs> All right, so now I'm going to get a little controversial. So the first thing is I want you to kind of talk a little bit about your military experience and why did you choose to go to the military? Well, the, it wasn't my first option. Uh, so I got out of college. I was doing mostly... Uh, oh, so you, went to, so you went to the military after college? Yeah. So you went as an officer? <laughs> I guess we got to talk about that. So. Yeah, I didn't, I, ain't, I didn't know you went to college first. Talk about, like, yeah, after high school, so you went to college? Went. So I went to a community college fresh, fresh out of high school back in 2014 because so, so I went to my, a community college for a year because I wanted to save some money and not go directly to university lifestyle. So did that for a year. Then I went through the last three years at Middle Tennessee. Yeah, so yeah, shout out to the Raiders. But yeah, so I graduated from there in 2018. And while I was uh, in school there, I was like a driver, a uh, driver manager. And also, well, I was driving also uh, box trucks overnight. So I was like doing driving things. Really wasn't thinking about What you majored in? So I majored in broadcast journalism. So my my thing was. What's your middle initial? Hold on. Where, where, why are we jumping all over the place? <laughs> we not. <laughs> what are we I, doing? I got a joke. That's what I see with your middle initial. What if I ain't got one? So you got a middle name? Well, maybe. Maybe I don't. <laughs> well, it depends on what the joke is. Nah, I was going to message you about, you know, Stephen A. Smith. So oh. it's going to be like Lee A. or Clayton. Yeah, well, my middle name began with a D, so. Lee D. Clayton. Yeah. You watch uh, One Piece? I ain't watched that stuff in so long. That's That thing, well, this show be going on like 20 plus years now, right? So I just said that because you know all the Ds in One Piece like me and some Monkey D. Luffy uh, uh, people. Yeah. yeah, I ain't watched that in a while, so. But yeah, but that's what I was doing back in college, just driving and uh, graduated and said, hey, well, back then, this was when I started to notice, especially b because the city I was in, in Murfreesboro, where the college was at, that's where I started to notice um, a lot of things being built up, uh, houses, the community was being built. So guess what? Prices start going up. So in my sense was, well, now I got the degree. I got some experience doing this driver manager thing. So I took with my ambitions <laughs> to go back to Memphis and thinking that life was going to be easier because it was still cheap back then to live in Memphis. Where rent was still like $600 where it's not even that no more now. But uh, so that's what I did. I went back to Memphis and was just not landing those driver manager jobs that I was. What is a driver manager? So, what I was doing is um, it was this company that got different routes to uh, car dealerships and they dropped off car dealerships, uh, car parts at night. And I drove at first. I was driving, I was driving uh, the trucks at first and then I switched to just sitting in the office and just managing the routes uh, with people having problems or they'll call in with issues or gate code changes or whatever. So I was just doing that. And it was like pretty easy money. Then I was in college and it worked with my schedule since it was uh, overnight. So, yeah, it was decent money back then, maybe like $800 a week, which was okay. considered rich. Yeah, that's what considered rich. I had bought my Mustang 5.0 with that money and everything back then. So, when, what year that was? Uh, what I bought the uh, Mustang? That was 2016. Okay. And they wondered, because back then it was like spring break was a. Uh, the big thing, everybody wanted to go to spring break. So every you were stunned with the Mustang. So I'm like, you know, I'm skipping on spring break this year. And they came back, <laughs> I had the Mustang. They were like, 
Yeah, y'all spent all y'all money on spring break. That's what I got. It's going to be around for a while. What color was yours? All black. Blacked out everything. Blacked out wheels. Uh, everything blacked was out. It so. that, um, was it that new 2015 model? No, I had a th- uh, 2013. But I spent a lot of my extra money just you know, <laughs> making that thing my car, basically. So, so yeah, that's what I was doing back then. Then moved to Memphis, and <clears throat> it just wasn't working out. Uh, so... My uncle did 20-some years in the military. He did Army and Navy. So he was like, man, why don't you just try military? I'm like, I don't see why not. Uh, not really doing much here in Memphis. So but he said, well, you need to try out the Air Force because I didn't, you know, it's harder to get into. You know, like, okay, i see if I can why do is that. that. Yeah, because it's, it's considered the the smart people, the people who do I don't I really be considering that when I be meeting it, these it's, Air it's Force re- people. I'm like, y'all just regular people. It doesn't. I mean, they have so so uh, some roles that require a little bit more knowledge, but all in all, they just have higher ASVAB scores that you need to make to land a decent role. That's not, you know, something that's going to have you hating your life for your whole term there. So, <clears throat> so yeah. So I, I told him I just try that out since he already did two other branches and we really didn't have on nobody in the family that I knew that did Air Force. So I went through that whole process and then started my enlistment 2019. Okay. Yeah, okay. So check you out. Yeah. Hey, it, it felt good being in Memphis with the Mustang, didn't it? Um, it felt good in college with it because oh, I you had, still was in college. With so it. I had, when I was in college, I had a older Mustang that I bought cash it was a twenty nine. It was a no, not twenty. It was a nineteen ninety eight Mustang GT. So was it that like body style they had like on um, Mister Society and stuff? Yeah, it was a. It's an older body style. Fox body. I think that's what called. Like no, no, it body. wasn't a Fox body. It was a SN ninety five. The SN ninety five came after the Fox body. Okay. And then uh, so I had that one, and then I bought the five hundred GT twenty sixteen. So I was I had two car. I had two Mustangs. So I had both of those at the same time. So, yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> you, you had them coming in and out of the dorm, didn't you? I was feeling myself back then, man, you know. But, hey, <laughs> but, yeah, that's that's what I was doing in college. And we had, like, a group of other guys. We all started our own uh, car club stuff. And that's, that's what I did on the weekend, just car stuff, you know. And uh, Memphis, you know, they have street outlaws that go there. They have recordings. They got a whole TV show that records, you no know, street races and stuff like that. So, so he was trying to make it big, like the biker boys. <clears throat> um, and yeah, not big, but you know, just Did y'all had like little vests and stuff. Y'all wore vests. No, no, no. I ain't gonna lie. I, no. When I grew up, I started seeing dudes. I went to school and so take them car clubs very seriously. Like they had the decals all in their car. Yeah. And they posted up like, <laughs> like they was real deal. Like a like a like little clip. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. The car clubs we had, they just had like decals they just put on that car, the Instagram label. <clears throat> but it wasn't, it wasn't, um, not, it wasn't that deep. Oh, but, okay. Uh, I know how you feel though. In 2015, I had got that new 2015 black GT. Uh, uh, yeah, you, yeah, you was balling there. You had the year that the car came out on that year. Yeah. I will, previously, I graduated from college 2013, November to be that, November 2013. <clears throat> And I can pull up on my Facebook now. I posted a magazine with that Mustang. And I always tell people, like, hey, this is the style I want. Yeah. End up getting in a bad wreck going to work in uh, the beginning of 2015. And I just joked. Somebody hit it? Somebody hit my car. No, I didn't have the Mustang at the time. I just joked. I was like, man, you know what? Oh, that made you get the Mustang to wreck. Okay. Yeah, I said, I did want a new car. Yeah. So I went and got it. And back then, hey, people would have swore I probably made, like, six figures with that GT back then. Yeah. They thought I just had money. I was, I was making forty k. I wasn't balling. Yeah, I mean they don't cost much, which is why I like them. They don't cost a whole lot. I mean, but that still was. I mean, that note was like five fifty. Oh no, my mine was three. <laughs> I played the cards right. Put a little bit money down, and I put a little bit down. But if I said if I knew that <coughs> note now, I just went to the credit union and I would have just paid the money down there. So it was a learning experience. I was like, growing up, they never had. Bought no new car. Like we always got yeah. a cash car or something used. So I didn't know the process. So I learned the game then. But yeah. I want to briefly talk about you in officer school, Officer Clayton. I mean, Officer. Yeah. I wish. 
Oh, so you wasn't an officer? No, so let's what talk. What happened? <laughs> let's talk about military recruiters. Well, <clears throat> so. Hey, um, hold on. FYI, <clears throat> FYI, y'all, he don't have a good relationship with recruiters. Well, hey. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> let's talk about the military recruiters, right? So the thing was back in the day, this was 2016, 17-ish, um, where you would talk to uh, military guys and they'll tell you, hey, we get you a degree, that's all you need to come in as an officer. So I always used to hear that, but back then I, wasn't really, I really wasn't thinking about military. I just used to always hear that because I used to come to the colleges and stuff like that. So now that I had my degree in 2018 and I go talk to military recruiter for Air Force, but they tell me is that, well, no, it's not just have a degree. You got to have a uh, high test scores. You got to have a recommendation from somebody that's, you know, who has some power like a colonel or a general that I get you a more um, seen that make your package more uh, noticeable when you uh, applying for officer uh candidate school so i'm like well i don't know any generals <laughs> in the air force um and then i took the uh they call it the afoqt which is the air force officer qualifying test i took that scores was you know subpar not the best of the best but still passing so they said well <clears throat> your best luck would be is to come in enlisted and because most of our officers in the Air Force are prior enlisted that switched over to officers coming in with no uh, military background without knowing nobody, then it's going to be really rough. It's going to be a long process. And at that point, I was just ready to get out of Memphis. And I said, OK, well, I, I'll do it for how long I have to do it. Oh, you just got to do enlisted for a year. Then you can apply to be an officer. Well, <clears throat> that was not the case uh, because I learned when I was in that it still takes more than just that one year of service to qualify as an officer as I talked to other people who've been trying for over 10 years to become an officer. So yeah, so that's how I went in enlisted with a degree and everybody looked at me like, why? But that's the story. So. Okay. Yeah. I'm thinking why too, but you just want to leave. Yeah. How was, so all right, we got all these different questions that come about the military. Yeah. How was, well, no, no. I don't even want to ask that. I've asked that too many times on pods with people I had on here. Why does it always seem like the game plan is get in the military, get 100% disability, and get out? That's the game plan. Um, Because think about it. I see most people get in the Air Force. They get a little sign on, and they go get them a charger. But if they not, if it wasn't for the military paying for them where they got to stay and stuff like that, they couldn't afford them cars. They couldn't afford it because – as an officer, the pay the pay band difference you can look it up. Well, on, no, no, officers get paid more. I'm just talking about regular people. Yeah, you can look up the the pay difference, but yeah, that's it's big. It's memes that goes around, right? Right. If you sign up for the army or whatever military branch, that you get a new Camaro, new <laughs> a new Charger. You know, they try to get the young people who fresh out of high school with yep. that that card selling thing. I already had the Mustang, so they couldn't sell me on that. So. um I guess why the game plans, I I didn't know about that until I got out or was on the way out about the disability thing. So I don't know if that's a real game plan, I think but it hey, is. It, it, it works. I was working with people at help desk that was like, if I was 22, Josh was like 23 or 24, full disability, and he was getting his help desk check. Yeah. And he was divorced. Let's talk about that. Did you get approached to get married while he's in the military? Approach to get married? No. For the extra money? What? What? Yeah. What people do is when you stay in the dorms and stuff, they get you know little marriages or whatever. But to move out, some people, you know, their marriages last a while. Some people, hey, it lasts a month. <laughs> so, just depends on your situation, man. We had a lot of people at my home church that were in the military, so that's why I don't trust military marriages. Uh, most of them are just. They got married to get married. They needed a little extra money. Or somebody convinced them they was going to get a whole bunch of money by getting married, then realizing yeah. this one ain't worth it. They could have kept that. Yeah, I think it used to be meal-to-meal, uh, -meal, which is military-to-military -military spouse. I think it was a recent change while I was in where both parties at first both got the housing allowance, but then they changed it to where if it's meal-to-meal, -meal, same branch, only one, only the higher ranking person gets the uh, the housing allowance. 
So, yeah, that took away some benefits from that. So, right. Yeah. So this last one, I'm, I'm turning this into some furious style stuff, man. So do you think the military is a place for a black man? Um, honestly, not a. It can be some places, and it depends on your unit and who you have is in leadership. Because if you have some people in leadership that actually is advocating for their people and minorities, and who does not forget their background where they came from, then it can be a decent experience. But if not, it's either you conform or you get out. So, so that's why you got out. <laughs> yeah. Did you were you able to have a haircut when you was in the military? Yeah, you can have um. I think you just can't have stuff that goes past your ears and stuff like that. So, really? did you get well? You don't really grow a beard, but uh, did you know the people that had the exception? Like you had to go to the doctor and be like, "Hey, I break out if I got to shave." Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of uh, people that get the shaving waivers, what they call them. But uh, I definitely would have to get one. Yeah, because you just show them the you just show the medical people one time all these bumps you get. They Put you on that waiver, but still, it's still regulations with that. It can't be too long. It can't be it too be long. In the mask gotta, or whatever. Yeah, I got to still follow the regulations. So, yeah. And so you were stationed where? In Los Angeles. How was that? Interesting because. That was uh, a culture shock from, from being in Memphis to being on the West Coast. Well, it's a big difference as far as lifestyle, as far as income, as far as pricing, as far as weather, and the people itself out there. Uh, but the base was interesting compared to other bases. As they say, it's not a real military basis because usually Air Force bases have, you know, planes and hangars and actually mm-hmm. have a flight line. That that base didn't. It was mostly space-related stuff. So SpaceX? Uh, yep, they worked with SpaceX, so it was right around the corner from there. And now they also are a, a space command. With them. Uh, they also are a space command now, too. So since the Space Force is out now, so... That base is considered a Space Force base now. I heard the logo is Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> no, but we had uh, one of the, what was it, astronaut? His name was Buzz Aldrin, I think that was his name. <laughs> he was uh, one of those. He was in the military, Air Force. He was an astronaut, and he was still alive. He came up to the uh, Deer's office one day. He was a superstar. Everybody just, the whole base just had a different atmosphere once they said he was arriving. So when you was in... LA, like, did you, were you scared to wear certain colors or you was, or what? Like, did they kind of like inform y'all, hey, if you're going out, wear this, wear that? So, those areas you're talking about, it's like Compton and Inglewood and stuff like that. Well, I really didn't hang out in those areas where the base was at, was El Segundo, which is considered like. I heard Kendrick rap about that. Yeah, El Segundo is a, a nicer area of LA. It's right next to LAX, the airport. Okay. But I also stayed in. Uh, they had a housing base in San Pedro, which was not too far from Long Beach. But as far as colors and where I, where I really didn't care that much because I n- never had that issue. But it became a problem one did day. You, it wasn't did about you check colors, in? though. Check in. Yeah, did you check in? When I got there. I'm being funny. You know how like, they tell the rappers you got to check in? Oh, you got to check in. Like, like Houston, what they say? Uh, they told one, yeah. you got to check in. Charles the White. <laughs> you got to check, check in. in. You come to our city. Yeah, no. Nah. No, I ain't, ain't nobody that's known out there, but yeah. So you're big league. No. <laughs> you from Memphis. Did you just say, hey, I'm from Memphis, man? You told them boys. You're from <clears> well, Memphis? it was obvious because what I, how I talk and I always ask, it's, it was an everyday reoccurring thing. I just wanted to have a, a sweatsuit that said Memphis because mm-hmm. I just knew was the that question your name? was coming. Yeah, they called me Memphis. Yeah, when I was at basketball courts, you know, you go to some courts, you know, everybody get their own nickname. How they go to Memphis? Like pick up Memphis, man. <laughs> so was you all star Air Force League and hooping? No, so um, I got they got a team. A ba- each base has a team, I'm, I'm sure, but I really didn't take it that seriously. I just played here and there. Really? You sound you be talking to me like you just was like that or something. Man, hey, I mean when we played, hey, I got videos. That's all I know. So you got intramural <laughs> videos. Uh, did we do intramural? I think I did intramurals once. I'm just calling it intramural because that's the only thing I could associate associated with. Like in college, you got intramural. Yeah, we did intramurals on base once, but really didn't like it. I don't like a lot of organized basketball. Why? Because it's I like it. Uh, I don't. Just like I don't really like. I like watching it. I don't really like unorganized like football. Automatic too. Everybody running nines. Like, bro, let's run some different routes. Yeah, because. 
Yeah, I like unorganized where you have more control of the game as the people. You don't determine. Somebody else is not determining what's a foul, what's a travel. You you actually seeing it for I mean, yourself. So people be getting getting over on some bull though when you be playing like anywhere else. Like yeah. Knowing to be a foul or, or a travel or whatever. Like, they be doing so much stuff on TikTok where a dude to do something that's like, well, see, I picked this foot up and put it back down. So everything <laughs> yeah. else, like, bro, if you got to do all that, you can have it. Yeah. People out there trying to be, I don't know, they be thinking they're going to the G League or something. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's how I used to be <clears> hooping <throat> in the intramural. I was like, bro, we got class, we got an eight o'clock tomorrow. Like, you ain't finna go yeah. nowhere. You're not finna make the tech team. Yeah. It's some people, hey, it's some people that's in, in the Air Force, especially my homeboy. He's on a New Mexico based team. He just came in town yesterday. He was telling me how this one guy um, who's on the base team is just, he made it to the actual Air Force team that actually plays in the NCAA. So he actually made it on that team. But then they also got like a, a all DOD team. I didn't know about that. You could have made that. They play overseas and stuff like that. But <clears throat> yeah. So. Did you find out that you want to get in tech right before getting out of the Air Force? So, in tech. So, what happened was, you know, in Air Force, you wear a million different hats. You mm-hmm. work wherever they place you at. So, my primary duties in Air Force was, like, administrative work and um, paperwork, records, pay bands, and all that good stuff. But then you have sometimes where I was needed in other areas, like, uh, they had a help desk in one of the uh, offices. And I was like, hey, well, we're going to put Clayton over here today. I'll show him how to do stuff over here. And it was it was a lot to, you know, catch up with because they always had a backlog of tickets and issues. I really didn't like it, but didn't have to do it too often. But uh, I did some of that. I did some shadowing with the, uh, I guess, the system admins, if you will call them there, um, the, the actual title is client systems but it's basically a system admin looking at what they was doing and I really didn't think about tech and yeah until I got out my my homeboys keep kept telling me about man you should do tech man when you get out do cyber security stuff man you already you already got the clearances I'm like I'm not really interested that much I thought I was gonna get into truck driver because you know that's I already had knowledge driver I already had knowledge of that so that's what I thought I was going to do. And then I go get my license and stuff. And then I just realized that, no, nah, I, don't, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to be on the road nonstop. Yeah, them lot lists just scared you off. And that and just, I just didn't feel like being on. I just moved. I had just moved to Dallas. And company offered me to be on the road three weeks at a time and two days at home a month. I said, what's the purpose of me? Even just, getting an apartment. Or even getting an apartment, if that's going to be the case. And of course, I could have looked other avenues, but that just that just did it for me. Just hearing that part, so then miraculously, um, I think it was like the very next day after I talked to that company, I get a a random call from a school called ACI Learning. So they said, "Hey, we saw your profile. It was interesting. You wanted to start a tech career." I'm like, "Uh, not really, but what y'all offering?" Um, so they told me how they got classes and you get some certs and hey you don't have to pay nothing you use GI Bill you get paid and at this time I really wasn't doing nothing I was still living off my um, I was on what you call that leave um, where you're not all the way out the military but you're still on leave so I was still living off of that I'm like you know what I might as well um, do this program so I did that so it's what eight no it's a 10 week program got some certs I'm like you know what they got to go this route. So that's how I got in from doing some stuff before and then just going through that and then just end up liking it. So, yeah. Was that ACI program? Was that the spot that's over there in Irving? Exactly. I know that because when I was laid off, I went to ACI and talked to them. Why? I have to go back. When you start talking to me, I'm going to go look at my email and I'll figure out why the ACI like hit me up about yeah. some stuff. And I think uh, also, I don't know if you watched the episode I did with my coworker that him and I used to work at TSA, help desk together, but he's out here in like Fort Worth now. And I think he teaches some classes at ACI. Mm, yeah. He's prior military as well. Yeah, they wanted me to teach, but uh, that's not my thing. Wow, man, you love talking. Yeah, but not teaching like the basic fundamentals of IT that I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about how to actually apply those things rather than 
you know, what is IT, what does it stand for, you know. <laughs> you know, stuff like that is what they was teaching a lot. So, so yeah. you went through ACI and got some certifications. What certs did they uh, stack you up with? So the come to your trifecta, you know, A plus, Net plus, Security plus. Then I also enrolled for the CEH. They had the course there, so I enrolled for that. Um, so I went through all the classes first. And while I was in the, oh, and then you get the ITL too. So the ITL cert. <clears throat> Can you explain to them what ITL is? Uh, what is that for? Inf- <clears throat> Information technology, infrastructure, library. It's something like that. It's just basically like a project management type of cert for IT. So it just basically says, um, you know, you, how companies should continue to improve. It gives you basic fundamental principles as a business that you should follow to have. Uh, you know, certain practices in, embedded into your companies talks about agile and scrum and all that good stuff that project management talks about a lot. So if you want to be on a management business side of tech, then that's what the ITL is there for. So it really wasn't much use to me, but I got it anyway since it was free. It'll so, be yeah. used to you eventually. I was working I was in an agile environment at JP Morgan and didn't even know it. I didn't know I was doing my sprints wrong. It yeah. took until almost at the end, so I was almost gone. I'm like, nah, you gotta either clear these out or start a new sprint every two weeks. And I was like, you never explained it to me. I was yeah. like, when I used to work in Jira, it was like, hey, go check out these rules, do this and that, and then come it back. And that's how my Jira be done. I didn't work on those sprints to do stuff. Yeah. So I was like, that was crazy to me. So yeah, so did that. Um, landed a help desk role, which yeah, I knew I wasn't gonna do that. So yeah. So where did you land your help this role at? That's a uh, Bank of America. Uh, I think I, I think at this point I was just when I got into the program, I just switched my whole persona up from trying to do this truck driving stuff into applying for uh, IT roles. So I think I applied for them, and obviously I did since they called me. Uh, it was basically hey. That is a help desk we're building up here in Addison, and uh, we want to see we're trying to hire. At least a hundred people to start up uh, this help desk, so that was good. So I tried to put a lot of people on, but a lot of people wasn't trying to. They, always, they didn't see the vision. They didn't see the vision. They just thought, "Oh, I got to get the cert first. And I'm like, I didn't even have a cert at this time, and um, it was just funny how everything just translated for the courses into the uh, the training. We had a two week training. I'm like, I know all this stuff already. I'm doing it in the classes I was in, so I know all that. So I started off. I know my first day, like outside of the training, taking tickets, and I just had a, I guess a, a fantastic day apparently because the site lead came over and said, "Man, you're killing it today. You done took thirty calls, and the average resolution is under two minutes. What are you doing?" And I'm like, "I mean, it's just easy stuff. Training, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's like just easy stuff, man. It's not, it's not rocket science. A lot of this stuff be common sense issues that people can fix, but it just don't." Think about it. So, like, yeah, man, we got people been here for years who ain't did 30 calls in a day yet. I'm like, well, don't know, man. That's that's just (laughs) that's just how it is. I guess I just had it easy, some easy tickets, but yeah. So I did that for a few months. Okay, I got some more help desk questions for you. So, number one, did you realize that it was a lot of us on the help desk? A lot of us. Mm. Uh, where I was at, it was a mix of people. Okay. Um, it's a good mix of folks, but what was the, what was the majority of, of the people? I would say it's, uh, if I had to break it down, it was, you said they had a hundred people. So, so yeah, between those hundred people, I think it was like maybe 30, 30 or 35% black. And you had some whites and middle Easterns and had a, it was a diverse yeah, group. I say it's diverse, but the only reason I said that because you've seen now, since leaving from that, that you'll never see that many black people in yeah. on the team again. Yeah, that 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 was yeah that job in IT was my even in the military when they when I did some IT work to help out. Yeah, it was still mostly you know uh, Caucasians and and some people um, you know from. <laughs> Some people. Some people from, you know, from. Uh, scared to say who it is? No, some people from, you know, like. 
Because they're not, fr- they're U.S. citizens, but they're, like, Hispanic, so. Okay. You know, so mostly Hispanics and white people that was on the IT teams and the Air Force, so that's what I was noticing, but, yeah. Yeah, so next thing is, like, so you said the stuff was simple. What type of calls did you get to help this? <laughs> Funny calls. Uh, one one person called me because we handled tech issues, computer issues. So this one was a like thirty second call. Hey, um, I called me because my Zell. I'm trying to set up my Zell. Well, we don't do that. <laughs> That's you calling the wrong department for that. Well, call chase. Call. So hey, handle that ticket easy. Uh, but other technology types of tickets that we got was you know hardware refreshes or some people computers may go down or. Hard drive, something internally hardware related had stopped working, had to get it replaced. A lot of VPN calls, not a lot of new hire, which I hated. Uh, when you when they call in, we had a system that automatically, based on their you know credentials, showed their profile of who they was and if they're a new hire. As soon as I saw a new hire, I knew it was going to be a long call because you got to set them up with VPN, you got to set them up with their first time logging in, and it's just a long process. That I told them should be handled through their manager. I think, um, in that sense, after telling them that, that we started getting less calls on new hires because it's nothing that we really needed to intervene with for them to just call us about that all the time. So, so it was stuff like that. You've had people call in like, hey, I can't connect to the internet. Yeah, I can't connect to, uh, a lot of people working from home, they can't connect to, they're like virtual machines. We had a, uh, uh, virtual desktop machines that a lot of contractors had to use. So, EDIs? Yeah, so we, we had to troubleshoot those. Uh, we had VMware Horizon, so let's just go into the the admin center, either run a script on them to get them back up and running or just do a, just a hard shutdown and making sure they're logging in with the right uh, server. That we had different, They had different locations on where people should log in based on their location. So if people clicking on the wrong one, then, yeah, it won't work because you're not at that location to use that that VPN to connect to that. So there was a lot of that type of troubleshooting stuff. Um, What else? There's a whole lot of different things, man. It was a diverse help desk, so. That's good. And so now we'll get into, like, some other stuff. It's like, because I was saying earlier, like, how me and you had the consultation. Like, I forgot, like, how did you even find out about me? Um, Well, I think. It was I, I was just starting to get to being on LinkedIn and somebody like that I followed or was connected with apparently either researched or posted content. I started watching some YouTube videos. I'm like, you know what? So I want to see what's going on. That's at this at this time I was interviewing a lot for higher level roles, and then it was at the point where I see that there was some knowledge gaps there. But at the same time, I always got told that you don't have to know everything to get land a. A job, so it's like okay, I'm interviewing a lot, and every interview I come across, it was always something that I didn't know, and I never got the job. So it's like, what what am I doing wrong? So I'm like, I wanted to talk to somebody who probably been doing it for a while, who can probably relate to it. So yeah, because I remember you sent me a job or something, and I was honest with you, saying, man, I don't know if your skill set fits that. Yeah, um, and that's the type of person I am, though. I'm just, I just want to be honest with people because I don't want them. Because think about it. If I'm telling you, I just apply and apply to everything, but I know your skill set don't match. And this, I'm talking about in general. Then you'll start getting upset with the whole process and everything. But I'm like, well, the stuff you're applying to, I think you'll be able to do it if you learn it. But judging off of how it's marketed on your resume, they probably don't know that. Mm. And a lot of recruiters, if that's not what they do on a day to day, they don't know how to probably get that insight of your own what you actually know how to do. So that's one of the things that I was saying of or whatever. But I think after that is when you hit me up, like, yo, I I landed the, the gig at the startup, right? That was Evo, right? Um, so the startup was called Share. It was a car sharing company. And I hit you up like the same day they gave me the offer. And I didn't, I wasn't expecting it because I scheduled the call a few days back. And it was just so happened to be it that when it was time for our call, they actually gave me the offer to start there. So it was right on time, I, I was guessing. But I was I still took the call just to say, well, this is what I was going through. But now <laughs> I got this. Let's see how this work out. But So, uh, yeah, I took that and turned out to be decent amount of knowledge and skills that was needed. That I landed through self-studying. 
Yeah, so self And that's a startup, yeah. right? Yeah, startup. And so from your experience, being a person that pretty much straight out of help desk, going into a startup, what do you feel about working in a startup as like pretty much like your first stepping stone type of job? I think it's a good experience if you have the mental capacity for it, right? Because it can be stressful if you let it stress you out, but I don't really let jobs stress me out. I just take things as they come. I know when I first started, my first week there, I was just completely lost. We had two days of HR videos, and then after that, because people was in Canada and California and Florida, they everywhere, I was expecting some guidance as to what we're working on, what we're doing, but <clears throat> I really didn't get that from the so-called manager I have. He wasn't really my manager, but he was like the lead so we had a lead, and we had the chief technology officer. That was the whole IT team. So I'm just sitting there for a couple of days, and I just shoot them a message on Google Chat. I'm like, man, what what am I doing here? Like, what is what is why am I here? What I'm doing? So they just got on the phone. He scheduled a meeting with the CTO and him and me on a on a Google Chat, and uh, he said, so this role will not be a you know A B C one two three type of thing where we tell you what to do and you just do it. So we want you to just find out whatever problems that's going on, offer some solutions and some suggestions on how we can do better or, you know, have some things in place. So I'm like, okay. So I'm, I just had open reign to do anything that I want. They were like, yeah, whatever tools you need to do whatever you need, go for it. So I guess the very first project I had was setting up mobile device management, MDM. And the help desk helped me out with that because I did a lot of that at the help desk setting, uh, with not setting it up, but actually using it and seeing what people was, what problems people were having and stuff like that. So, Can you elaborate a little bit more about why you should have MDM in your environment? Yeah, because <laughs> these people, they, they had, they had remote workers. And I know this came up in the interview I had with them too. They said, Hey, so how would you secure a remote environment with remote workers and, and their devices, they had company devices. I'm like, well, that's a simple MDM solution, right? So that was one of my first projects to set up. Um, so what will happen is people will leave or get fired or whatever. And since they all had just regular computers, so you can just buy the store, but it was company. So the company sent these sent them the computer. They'll send it back with locked out. Like people will set their own password, do whatever they want on the computer. They had no oversight of what was actually going on. So they said, well, we got tired of getting locked out and having the factory reset the computer where it could be some data on it that we probably need. So that was the purpose of having that in place, actually tracking what people are doing, keeping the company from being locked out when people get fired and managing, you know, just their environment of what they downloading and things they looking at they shouldn't be and all that good mm -hmm. stuff, right? So Cool. Look at you learn, learning something on, on the fly. Yeah. What was the next like thing you you did there? So I had to learn AWS on the fly. I had to learn, like you said, I had to learn the Scrum and Agile stuff because I had to talk to the developers every day on um, things that they're working on and had to set up uh, servers in the cloud of AWS. So another thing they had is since they had a, a car sharing application and they took payment card information. The thing should be VPN protected, especially if it's remote stuff. So I had to set up a VPN. The VPN they had was never working. They said the client always broke <laughs> and it just caught, it was costing $500 a month. That was they tasked me to come up with a solution to replace the one that they had. So I just started doing some Googling. I came across an open source platform called pre-tunnel or something like that. It was basically free. Well, it, it was, it was free to set up, but, for enterprise type of environment, which I saw on there, it was only like seventy dollars a month. So I'm like, hey, you can get this one, seventy dollars versus five hundred, and it works. But you had to set it up on your own instance, so that's why I had to go in the AWS I think they call AMIs and pick the image. Okay. I ran it on Oracle and installed all the packages for that server and got it set up. I had to do some routing configurations and stuff on it. I had to set up, uh, you know, single sign-on capabilities and. So you really a security engineer? Yes, yeah, so I had to do all. I had to do all that, setting up the routing and things. I wire guard on it, setting up um, how people would connect to it, and making it easy 
for people just to, hey, just click here where it says sign on with your Google because we use Google Workspace. Mm -hmm. It's a hybrid type of cloud. So they use Google for managing their accounts, AWS for you know developing and things like that. So I made a service account on the Google Workspace and added it to that server. So now when people go to the server's address, all they got to do is click you know, sign in with your Google credentials. So it's like SSO? Yep, I had to set that up, yep. It was pretty interesting stuff. So it seemed like you had a lot of, you did some good work there. What made you want to leave? Well, I didn't want to leave, but um, I got hit up for the company I with now, and I'm glad I did because coming with now, uh, I've been I was trying to get on there for like a whole year, <laughs> and then somebody I seen on LinkedIn was just saying how he referring people to the company, just hit them up. So I hit him up, and then he referred me to like ten roles, and I applied to all of them. And one of them came through. He said, "Hey, they looking for your your resume for this one. Go ahead, apply." So I applied. They called me back up like three weeks later, set up an interview. Well, they didn't call me. They just sent me an email to set up an interview with the with the team and pretty straightforward, just easy questions that I learned on my own. Um, like what is RMF and like just easy stuff like that. So <laughs> what is like, RMF? Yeah, just risk management framework. What is it? What you think the most important step is? And what do you think the most important step is? <laughs> so since Yeah, so since I knew what that stuff was and I looked it up on my own, I was like, it's a lot of this stuff seems like it's more policy based. So I'm like, it doesn't make sense to have um, all this policy. I'm like, they have a step where you implement, actually implement what you set forth in the company. So I'm like, hey, I think the most important step is actually implementing the stuff that you said needs to be in place. So told them that. It was a straightforward interview. How do you define success? And, you know, will you <laughs> stay? Are you? And then I'm glad I actually got my security plus in November 2022. Because they wanted you to have that to come in. They interviewed me in January. They wanted you to have that. So, so hey, you got Security Plus. Will you, you know, abide by always having it, uh, <laughs> you know, having it up? I'm like, yeah, having it uh, current. I'm like, sure. Mine expired years ago. Yeah, so, hey, hey, if they paying for it, don't. I say, sure, it'll be there. And, uh, and yeah, so I was just, I wasn't even a whole month in the startup when they gave me the offer. So they, the recruiter hit me back and said, hey, pick a start date. So I'm like, hey, I'm trying to drag it out as far as I can because I was in the middle of working on projects with the startup. So I'm like, I didn't want to just leave when I'm in the middle of doing some stuff. So finished up the projects. I pushed out my start date like two months, like as far as date I can get. So I pushed it out, told them I was leaving, then got into the company I'm with now. But, hey, everything happens for a reason because that company now is just, <laughs> it doesn't even exist anymore because of some, bad business they was doing with the CEO. So. Yeah, and that's what I was going to ask you. I forgot to ask you. What did you, what were you getting paid at that first help desk gig? That was paying me 20, 25 an hour, so. You was making big money be help desk. I don't know about BK. that. Okay. Bro, man, you'd be surprised what people be making yeah, money they, help desk. Yeah, I see 18 and stuff like that, but that was a pretty good start of, uh, starting out pay. The minimum pay was like 22. Mm-hmm. And like, So you negotiated 25? I think they were offering me 23 at first. I'm like, eh, I don't know. I, you know. I'm getting these certs and a lot, a lot. I'm like, okay, we can give you 25. That's the highest we can go right now. I'm like, sure. Yeah, my okay. highest was 19. They weren't even trying to give me that back in the day. Yeah. So What about the startup? Like, what what the startup offered you just for you to leave? Uh, the startup, it was offering 80. So that's a 30K jump. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I took that to the manager. I'm like, hey, I... I know this probably a long shot, but I might as well ask. Can y'all match this? I'm like, oh, no, nah, brother, you making what well, my manager's here making now. And he wished me well and said, hey, hey you got to take that. So I, couldn't be, I wouldn't be mad at you for taking that. Right. And I bet once they found out you was leaving, everybody started trying to see, well, what you know how to do and this yeah. and that. And how, I'm trying to leave the help desk, too. I want to make $80,000. Every, every, almost all the people there just, you know, act like I just made it out, you know, made it out the hood or something like that, so. <laughs> and I'm asking them that because every podcast I talk about how in real life and not on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, people is not making more than eighty thousand dollars. You got people that's making forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars. Yep. Eighty thousand is a lot to them. So stay out social media, keep your head down, and just try to elevate your life some type of way because people will be happy to get that money. The job, matter of fact, it's I think I bookmarked it. I'm gonna read it. I'm gonna find it in a second, and we'll talk about it. Now, 
What do you do at your current position? Well, I was doing a well, lot the of... The first role, and then we'll get into the current one. Well, the first one, where I'm at now, where I was doing is just policy creation, a lot of paperwork stuff, hardware labeling, and, you know, just configuration management on information systems. Like, you just have to have them compliant with the government standards of things need to be properly labeled. You need to have a security policy in place on how this system will be used. How would you start downgrading classified information? Just having that policy stuff implemented was what I was doing, which I really didn't like that much. So I think my managers caught on to that real fast. <laughs> so, yeah. I found a tweet, and I'm going to put it on the screen once I do this in post-processing. He said, y'all for real ain't taking these 70 to 80K entry-level roles as your first ever tech job. Damn, y'all rich, rich. I would have taken that in a heartbeat and go up from there. Yep. Yeah, that's some, it's still decent money today. I mean, depending on where you live, too, but hey, it's still. Hey, if you stay in Shreveport or Memphis, you might be straight. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> definitely good money out there. The people still look at me crazy if I tell them what I make now. You make, oh, no, you might as well stay out there. Don't move back to Memphis. <laughs> Man, it's a TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if y'all seen it, but it's a dude playing the game, and it's like uh, rent six twenty five, and he hears some gunshots right by him. Yeah, well, and he go back to playing the game. That's I'm like, yep. cause that's a real thing, though. I, I tell everybody, men will stay wherever for for super cheap, but once you got a family and kids, that's when you start you to try to get them in somewhere safe. Yeah, dudes don't really care a whole lot as long as it's livable conditions, you know. My first apartment here, I thought it was good. It was decent, but where you was at? It was in Plano. It was called the Layton. <laughs> it was like the pictures. Layton and was staying at the Layton. Yeah, it was a, uh, it was decent looking. But then you, I was what in was there. By? Independence Parkway. I'm still trying to learn all the areas out here, so I'm I'm not really. I know Independence. I'm not really uh knowing of big landmarks and stuff. But it was over there in that area and. Like I said, it would have been a good place if you never needed maintenance. As long as the maintenance stuff had to happen, then that's where you start to see how it like, take weeks to get something simple done, and I was over that. So I just stayed all over kind of like the North Dallas Carrollton area. Yeah, so it was my first apartment here. It was a it was a good start. Give me where I'm at now, right? So, mm-hmm. so what type of now? Here's the thing: me and him go back on a lot of different stuff. That y'all been hearing me say. Training to him because it's an insider training. Yeah. <laughs> what type of stuff do you do now at work? Or what, what would you consider your title to actually be now? More of a a security engineer or That's something like that. I call him a platform engineer. Yeah, I would think it's more of that because it's actually more the other side of it was ISSO work and government people know what that is. Um, more of just documentation and people say it's low stress and things like that, but it's just not where I saw myself for a career. So management saw that. They say, hey, well, I work with this guy who does these. He needs some help with the tools, actually getting them configured and set up right. Because the way it's set up where we at is everything is air-gapped on different networks, so you have to touch everything individually. So he's like needed some help on if he configure one, and then he had to replicate it to all the different networks. So, so yeah, it was, it was pretty interesting stuff. Okay, all right. Any specific tools that you work with now that you see out there? Yeah, we got Splunk. We got the uh, Tenable Security Center, Trellix, Epo. You know, I hear all the bad stuff about them, so they all over Reddit. I think the, uh, the only real entities that still use them are even government or government contractors for some reason. But I don't understand it because they also have on the unclass side, it's CrowdStrike, so, so, so it's like... Why not have it on both sides? But hey, right. So now, y'all, here's here's the fun stuff. All the stuff me and him disagree with. I've been ready to have fun. <laughs> so <laughs> you have like a lot, over here. yeah, because you have like a lot to say <clears> about <throat> people. Matter of fact, while he starts talking, I'm gonna go find like his posts because they be they be different. But what are people? What's your opinion now on the job market? How about that? <clears throat> so, I mean, I, everyone sees it. Even people who not even looking for tech jobs, my auntie called me. It was saying, "Hey, don't you do this cybersecurity stuff you be talking about?" I'm like, "Yeah." She's like, "Hey, I seen the ad about how it's so lucrative right now." <clears throat> um, yeah. So that's that's the selling point ads. Uh, people boot camps and schools. 
are pushing the agenda of there's so many cyber professionals needed and it's so easy to get into, so much money to be made. And it's a booming market because it's but there's always some but it's something about three million or some type of means of cyber jobs left unfilled. But it's not really the case that what I can see because there's a lot of people who are getting these so called credentials that they need to get the jobs, but they can't get them. But um it's a lot. It's a lot that goes into that. Uh what I've been hearing about is fake job postings to make this company sound like they're actually growing when they're not for business purposes. And just a, just a false advertisement of what's actually available for you to actually get into. So people are just, you know, just running around chasing their own tail with no end in sight. So, yeah. <clears throat> now, and here I'll probably agree with you a little bit. Because when it comes to cybersecurity, because it's so vast, it's not like other professions or you want to say uh, specialties. For example, if you want to go possibly into the cloud, it's a little bit more straightforward on what you'll be doing in the cloud. If you look at cloud engineering or anything that's related to the cloud job descriptions, they're a little bit more in line. If you type in security analyst, you'll probably find 15 different job descriptions. Sure, probably more than that. <clears throat> right. And that's because I, so that's one of the things when I tell people don't get caught up in the hype of the title because titles mean different things, different places, focus on the skills that's in the job description and, and what it wants you to do first. Yeah. So what do you think? Do you think it's possible for somebody to get like five certs in 90 days and get their first cyber security job? I mean, anything is possible, right? Yeah. Dude, that's how they, let that's me how rephrase they... it then. Let me rephrase it. <laughs> Do you yeah. think it's ideal? Let's not say possible then, because if you're going to nitpick me like that. <laughs> I mean, hey, I mean, it's possible. People have done it. So, you know, when you have one or two people in a boot camp or whatever in- institution it is, they say, hey, these are success stories. In the first 90 days, they got these search and they got a great paying job with no experience. Then, okay, if you have 10,000 plus people in your institution and you can give a success story for five, it's not really a good a really good rate of, you know, real success that you have there. So people see the success stories and then, you know, that's how they bite into the, the programs. So is it ideal? It's not ideal because right now there's no sh- talent shortage for cyber, quote unquote, cyber security entry level roles. They want people with years of knowledge and then there goes that question of how can I get experience if I don't have a person or company willing to take a chance on me so that's that's the big what they call it the catch 22 that people going through right now of hey how do I get experience if I can't even land a role so do you think it's more ideal that people take more feeder roles to get into cyber versus just trying to go right into cyber from jump with no type of high level skills anywhere else I guess that depends on where you are in your career. Of course, if you are fresh out of high school or college or something and you don't have a lot of bills or something coming in, then, yeah, you can take a lower-leveled role because you don't have a lot of bills. You could take that you know, that pay and learn some things and build your skill sets up. But it's a lot of people who are successful in their careers and they're just tired of it, have a lot of nurses trying to switch into it, have truck drivers trying to switch into it, you have – some some lawyers trying to switch into it. So it's some people who've been in their career fields for 10 plus years and now they want to get into tech because they're tired of where they at. So would I recommend them go to the help desk? <laughs> I wouldn't say that because... Um, but you, we know help desk isn't like the only feeder role. I mean, yeah, but you know, that's what a lot of people say. Hey, you should start up a help desk. I'm like, well, that don't work for everybody. This video will be sponsored by Level Careers. It has a 14-day money-back guarantee. It's a we self paced course. Employer reimbursement and counts for continuing education. Here are some of the reasons why you can choose cybersecurity, high demand, job security, competitive salary, work variety, and fulfilling work. The national average salary of an information security analyst is up 113,000. Your instructor is Josh Medicore, and here is the brief overview of the course. Theory introduction, security refresher, security frameworks, security regulations and standards, 
security operations table. Then you have these great labs with Azure, Logging and Monterey, Microsoft Sentinel, Secure Cloud Configuration, and they help you with job hunt and job hunt execution. Use my code to try out level careers. You'll get 10% off by using my code and you'll be taking the next step in propelling your career to new height. Now back to our schedule program. Right. I agree. I think it depends on what you're trying to do. I got no help that can be foundational in some ways based on what you're going to try to do after that, but it can also be more of a hindrance can it, than it could be helping you out because it only limits your scope sometimes to being a help desk analyst. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> I had an interview with one company. Uh, I forget the name, but it was for uh, identity access management type of thing. Mm -hmm. And it was something that was trying to relate from my help desk to this role because they said, what I asked them what they what they do in their current roles, and that's how where we provision access to certain technology system based on whoever the users is, and most of those we work those type of tickets. I'm like, oh, I do some of the same things. And people call us, excellent, hey, I got no access to this application. And then we tell them, hey, submit a ticket on this this site here, and then it provisions you access to that based on if you are in the group to have that application or not. So I'm like, oh yeah, I'm doing some similar stuff like that already. But only thing they saw on my resume was his help desk. And I think they were just talking to me just to say, hey, we interviewed a lot of people. And right. Did you say on your resume that you provision access? Um, I don't, I don't change my resume so much. Uh, back then at that point, I, I'm not sure. I think I had most of the troubleshooting stuff I was doing with different technologies. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's the, and so that's the pitfall. This is for help desk people right now. That's the pitfall that you'll fall into. Like I was working with a guy. He had some of the, the stuff he was doing. Actually, last night I, I went through, kind of went through his resume with him. I was like, this stuff is good, but when they read this, all they're going to see is help desk. I was like, take off all this troubleshooting stuff and let's put stuff that you helped with. He was saying, he was telling me how they helped stop a fishing campaign and some other stuff. I said, like, yeah, put all that stuff on there. That's going to show you got a grasp of the roles you're applying to. But it's so much, like at certain help desks, it's so much stuff. You, you can't yeah. put everything. Well, the thing is, the reason why is a lot of people, I don't want you to put what you do day to day. Let's put achievements of things you are proud of different or different things you do at the job because a help desk can comprise of different things. You could probably be doing some networking stuff, yeah. some support stuff, some hardware stuff, identity access management. You could be running scripts. There's different things you could do because you need to write the stuff down. I think a lot of issues is people get to the job and they don't write down what they do. Yeah. So they'll just go take the job description and put it on their resume. And that's why they're not getting no success. And how do I know that? Because I used to do it. Yeah. And if I used to do it, other people did it. <clears throat> and, yeah. that, and that's why your resume wasn't good. It's not actionable. Yeah, I mean, the resume got me the interview, but I think they asked me some questions. I knew the answer to, you know, vulnerability management and stuff like that from just self-studying. Uh, what you know about, you know, uh, VMware. I'm like, oh, yeah, we're using VMware Horizon where I'm at. Provision access, different virtual machines. I just had an answer to everything except of uh, that's more type of vulnerability scans you run. I'm like, mm -hmm. well, I don't do that currently. So like, I'm not, I don't run vulnerability scans where I'm at. I'm like, oh, okay, that's fine. Uh, but that was the only thing I didn't know. I'm surprised then. you say, yeah, you know, we, uh, you could have said, yeah, as a company, we run these. Technically, mm -hmm. you wouldn't been lying. Yeah, but hey, I, did, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't. You weren't the Clay Talk Show yet. You I wasn't just... thinking on my feet back then, but the funny part about that is, <clears throat> uh, I hit the recruiter where she hit me up after the interview. They were like, so yeah, you did good in the interview, but they say your skill set is more fit for a help desk role, which is not in the salary range that we talked about for this role. So um I'm yeah. confused. What the how does that make sense? She said your they say your they feel as though your skill set is more fit for a help desk. Cause she called me, said, What was your salary range that you're looking for? Back then I said um seventy to ninety K and I think the role was paying like eighty five. And uh so they were pretty much saying your skill set didn't fit what you wanted to be paid. Basically, yeah. Like, even though I knew like 90% of the stuff they were talking about already. Because I didn't know that one thing. It, you know. I, but why do you feel like it was that one thing? Because I had a great answer. Or I had but what, understanding of what they... And this is what me and him get into. Because he'll yeah. tell me he said this or that on, on an interview. And I was like, well, did you record it? Well, I recorded some now since <clears throat> I'm doing much more. I'm doing a lot more interviews now, but back then I wasn't I wasn't aware of the challenges the tech field pr presented. I didn't think it would be this hard to move up or laterally the way I wanted to. But then this is where I started figuring figuring it out that yeah, this stuff is not A B C 
black and white, <clears throat> like they wanted to <clears throat> they wanted to um, present to you in these co- in these courses and online. But I don't think that. I think I think that some people sell that, but I think mostly people don't say it's like A B C, because the courses that I do promote are typically ones that actually have stuff to help people with that and understanding the interview process in general. Because like I said, it's hard for somebody who's been doing help desk to change their mindset from answering from a help desk. Like I had, remember I did the the post and I was talking about my client and the situation where he was talking about MFA from a help desk and user's perspective, but not from a security perspective of what con- this control can be used for, what type of policies we can use to help fortify our defenses he was just focused on always oh, easy interface for the end user. That's not yeah. what they're looking for when they ask you at an interview. Yeah, I had to learn that a hard way too. So I had to change the mindset. I was talking to different people, then that's how I came across, you know, your stuff again. And yeah, just an everyday learning experience. Yeah. Like like right now, I I got a client, I think he got he has an upcoming interview for a sock analyst. So he did I always tell them, Okay, cool. Go take my questions that I have posted on my or pinned to my profile on LinkedIn and go do it so I can assess your skill set and then I can reply I can review it and I can tell you what you work on so by the time you really get to the interview I also send you the stuff the little BS stuff they'll they'll send you about like oh what is this what is SSH what is port 53 all that BS crap you can just go memorize that that's really not a good way to measure if you're gonna be good at the role yeah I got a sock analyst uh, interview for when I was at the startup company uh, I think it was Evo. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. I thought Evo was a startup. No, Evo was a payment. So they, they big. They're yeah. internationally known company. Probably would have gave you a raise by now. Uh, but they wanted me to come in at the same pay I was already making. But uh, yet in a in an interview, first of all, it was an on site interview, so that was a Did long. Did you have a suit on? No, I just went in my work clothes. What and you had uh, on like just had like a little clothes. polo, uh, some khakis. You got some polo boots. No, I just had, <laughs> had some, some tennis shoes on. I had yeah. some Nikes on some that day. But yeah, he said, so yeah, man, so we had these in person now because when I was doing interviews back in the COVID day, days, I had these virtual interviews, and I just felt as though people was Googling answers. I was seeing them looking around, looking down, and la, la, la. So now we're in person. I'm like, that's fine. The only thing they really asked me was a lot of port numbers. I'm like, what, what, what service is this? What port is this? What port number is this? I'm like, well. I gave it all, all of that was on the top of my mind since I was in ACI at the time. So it was all right. easy stuff to just blurt out. I'm like, that's what it is. But uh, I made it through that process and I made it to the final steps. And I think they were trying to offer me that same salary for working I think longer I told you to hours. I, no, I think I was working longer hours, 12 hours. And I'm like, it's like what, three days a week? It was rotating. So some days it'd be four, some days it'd be three. It was like you 12 think you should have took it? Nah. For the experience? Mm-hmm. No, nah, because I was getting more experience where I was at at the startup because I was touching so many different things. I was touching cloud. I was touching, uh, I was basically from beginning to end procurement of software. We procured CrowdStrike. They said, hey, we need antivirus because antivirus we got sucks. So, uh, hey, I had to set up a call. They said, find a vendor. I found CrowdStrike. I had to set up a call with them, talk to them about our environment, talk about how many endpoints that we have, what our goals are as a company, what are we trying to protect from. So I had to talk to that that, uh, that procurement standpoint, also deploying it standpoint, configuring it standpoint. So I went the whole, like in another company, there'll be different roles. It'll be a, you know, probably a project program manager or something who actually talks to the vendor, another company, another team who actually sees how to configure it. Another team who actually configures it and deploys it. it. I was doing the job of four people put into one. So I think that gave me more experience than that, that sock would have gave me. So, Okay. I feel like that. You feel like you should have rolled the startup out until no, the wheels fell off? No, because, uh, like I said, they... <laughs> no, no. I said to the wheels fell When did the wheels fall off? The wheels fell off two months after I started it where I'm at now. Now just... I hit up uh, one of the old product managers saying how she was doing. She's like, oh, we're not doing it all. I'm like, what does that mean? She's like, uh, everybody's looking for another job because we went two weeks without getting paid and ain't nobody heard from the CEO. All the shareholders either quit or got fired and we just, everybody's in the dark about what's going on and then you just go look up some articles about the the guy you see. He's on a run, owes over a hundred million dollars in investments to people and it was just crazy. So I was like, well, I guess I, guess I got out at the right time. 
two months, two months would have went by, would have been unemployed. Yeah, <laughs> got you. All right, look now, here comes some fun stuff, man. Let's react to some some TikTok content. All right, yeah. like I said, I love doing this. This creator, she be doing her thing, but a lot of stuff you can tell is word salad, and I'm gonna show it to you right here so you can listen. Unnecessary fluff. <laughs> Ever plays. Yeah, why is it not playing? October is the new January, and it's also Cybersecurity Month. If you're not interested in making six figures by the end of the year, if you're not interested in breaking into tech by the end of the year, this video is not for you. So many companies are desperate for cybersecurity professionals because this is an area that the U.S. has been neglecting. So all of a sudden they're realizing, oh, snap, Russia, India, China are all advanced, and we've been behind. This is your opportunity to hop in and make some money. You could be well on your way into making six figures. And I want to help you out. Cybersecurity isn't a profession, it's a practice. It's a discipline rather than a field. Cybersecurity is the way you design your systems. It's First of all, you could tell she was reading from a script. She kept on turning around. It's not sounding confident. Cause she's a person that just got in. Like I always get on the people like, why are y'all giving people advice you don't know enough yet? But at the same time, People who trying to get in, I say listen to the people who just got their role because if you listen to some outdated advice from 20 years ago, some people don't be up to speed with what's going on. Hey, you should easily be able to get a job. I'm like, yeah, maybe 20 years ago. You, How many years of experience you have? Oh, I'm, I've been doing cyber for 20 years. I'm like, it's not like that no more. Yeah, but those people who are really fresh getting in, some of them don't have like, I can also say getting a cyber sometimes can be a luck game. Yeah, like I think yeah, I already definitely. had experience, but I think the fact that hey, I was in the right place at the right time when going to the McAfee, like signing up for the talent community, going there, talking to the manager, seeing my resume, them hitting me back up, like yo, when can you start? I feel like that's right time, right place. Yep, exactly. That's another thing. But that's why I also tell people location can be an issue. I also tell people it's really no, like you say, it's no one right way. But I'm not gonna go out there and just tell you it should be easy for you to go get six figures because it's not. Because most right. of the time that's still mid to senior level, depending on some companies that low ball, that might be principal level money. So they're expecting you to know how to do stuff. And her saying, well, it's not a thing. It's a practice and it's how you do this and that. Like you don't have to, it, it's, it, as the girl say, it's giving you want to sound smarter than what you are. And she's a person like she was talking about, like I reacted to her stuff before all in all, I'm happy. Like she doing what she's doing, but people have to be careful. Cause that's not even nothing in there. She said was actionable. Just like, Oh, it's the shortage in the USA. We're behind. It's not even, if that's the case, it would be super easy for people to get jobs. It's still not easy. Not easy. Especially got, in the private sector. It's definitely not easy. Um, you got people who done took the hard route. They done did the degree and things like that. And they ain't in the hiring manager positions. And they say, and the, and the easy route of person say, well, I did my 90 day boot camp. Uh, ain't got no degree or nothing or no experience. But hey, they say I can make six figures in 90 days. I'm here in the interview. What's up? <laughs> I remember look at those people and say, uh, yeah, well, okay, we're going to see what you know. Asking them some questions, and then, you know, they go blank in the face. And then that's what happens. Don't get a job, and they go through that cycle maybe five, ten times before they realize, yeah, maybe I just got bamboozled into thinking it was going to be easy. Yeah, that's the thing. Somebody should never tell somebody, hey, it's going to be easy because it's hard. And I tell people, you get a lot of certs. Early on, sometimes the interview is going to try to interview you a little harder than what it would be. That's called overselling yourself. I oversold myself for a role one time, but that company's kind of slick. They, my co, my old coworker was working there, so it's coming for an interview. They pushed the interview up on the time where he, they knew he wouldn't be there, mm -hmm. so they could BS my interview and just started asking me about stuff. But I played myself because, for one, I had um tools back back in the day. I used to put every tool I had access to on my technical skills. Mm -hmm. But I shouldn't have did that. It should have only been <laughs> tools could that I could talk about indefinitely. Secondly. I even butchered this. They were like, oh, yeah, because I'm just being honest. Back then, I didn't even know I was on blue team. I just know I was working. Like I had worked in the sock. They were like, oh, you red team, blue team. I was like, man, I don't know. I knew the answer after that because mm -hmm. that's why I tell people. like sometimes it really don't matter, and you probably listen. It's like, man, how you didn't know that? I was like, well, back then, things was a little different. It wasn't as hot like where you can go every – couple of articles and see something about cybersecurity and yep. they talking about red team, blue team. They more so was going off of the the titles like oh a hacker or a pen tester or you work in the soccer, you do like forensics. They wasn't saying like, oh you the you the blue team person and you the red team person. That or like even 
Then you got the mix of that, like the, you got the purple team, and I think they got like one called like orange or something now. I think it's green. Green that's what, orange. That's what one guy said he do green team basically like appsec engineering. Yeah, so it's like so many different things. So you could technically not know like what that is. And I was like, that was a funny interview though. That's why I tell people like, don't oversell yourself. You're gonna feel played. Yeah. I suppose, but hey, that's what they're looking for, people who got every skill under the sun. This is another one. This dude, he always make a lot of sense. Let's check him out. Make a lot of sense. Here's why you won't get into the cybersecurity industry. Now, usually I'm all about trying to be positive on this page and motivate you guys on this page, but there's going to be some people where no matter how much information I give them on how to get into the industry, no matter what boot camp I recommend to them, no matter if we figure out a path to say you should get a college degree, right? No matter if they want to go to free route, no matter what information I give them to get into the cybersecurity industry, they won't apply the information. I talk to people every single day about how to get into the cybersecurity industry, specifically the information security industry, specifically governance, risk, and compliance. People will DM me on Instagram, find me on LinkedIn, and I'll send them a link to set up an appointment with me or someone else from my team, and then they won't show up to the appointment. I'll send them the free link to Professor Messer's YouTube channel to start studying for their Security Plus certification. I'll check in with them you know, a couple months later, hey, how are things going with your Security Plus certification? And they stopped watching the videos. And then sometimes I'll get on meetings with people and they won't have like any questions prepared and I can kind of tell that they haven't done any of their own research at all. And something that I pick up on when I'm in a call with someone is, if you tell me about a lot of the problems that you're facing, you should also be able to tell me about the solutions that you've tried. So if you can't do basic things like show up for meetings when you schedule them, or even just communicate with someone that you're not gonna be able to make the meeting, right? These are the kind of things that you actually have to do in a corporate environment. So if you can't do them on a small scale now, what makes you think that you're actually gonna be able to do them if you're working at a Microsoft or you're working at a Comcast or a Google or an Apple or an SAP or whatever? 50% of the corporate game is about being able to effectively communicate and stick to your word. So if you tell someone that you're gonna meet a certain deadline, you have to make that deadline or you have to communicate with that person as to why you won't be able to make that deadline. And it needs to be a good reason. And I hate to say it, man, but some of you guys are just simply just lazy. Like some of you guys are literally just lazy and I can't teach you how to not be lazy. That's something that you have to have inherently. Uh, Oh yeah, that makes sense, man. You know, people want the, you know, the outcome of hard work without putting in the hard work. So, that makes sense too. So, but that's on one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is you got people who are trying everything under the sun and still having a hard time too. So, I think the people that may be trying everything under the sun cannot be effective because they just keep on trying everything under the sun. Yep. So, like, think about it. You, you got to zoom in on what you really want. You play, you know, you was All Star Air Force. So, you play All-Star. ball. A person that's first start off playing ball, if they don't even master something simple and they say, all right, well, today I'm dribbling, tomorrow I'm shooting. Tomorrow I'm working on defense. Today I'm going to work on dunking. They ain't going to be successful at nothing because they ain't mastered at least one skill. Yeah. So when you try and every other thing or I talk to people say, oh, I think I'm interested in pen testing. I'm different than that. Or what do you think about this? But I'm like, you going too many places. You're not going to be successful. Find one discipline and stick with it. Just like chopping down a tree. Just get your ax and keep on chopping. It's going to eventually fall. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that they mess up on. And if we get into it too, like, Everybody want to be sometimes cheap. Yeah. They want to pay. And if you do something free, they're not going to show up or respect it. People only respect when they got to spend their own money. Well, I guess I'm different. I, I try to avoid spending money wherever I can. But if you spent your own money, you want a certain service and you're going to respect it because you work hard for your money, right? Yeah, but true. I went to ACI for basically free. That's just, different. Somebody paid for it. Yeah, somebody paid for it. I still went. And, and you knew the outcome, like you was dedicated. It's kind of like going to school. But I'm just saying, yeah. I'm just saying, Jake. In general, speak, generally speaking, I've realized doing this for going on like four years now. People respect what they pay for. Yep, they do. Hey, I'm paying for this. I need to do this, this, and this. I'm like, I got you. Unless they got money to blow, that's not a lot of people. 
Some people got, I mean, now you're right about that. Now, some people are the people that no matter what, they're going to do good regardless. It's, that's why it's different people. That's why I say, hey, it's different ways. That's why there are people, when I have consultations, I might recommend them a certain course or something that's a little bit more hands-on that I'll say, hey, well, these people have this course. They teach you this, this, and this. You can call and check them out or check these people out because you may need that. Because like you said, you did a lot of self-study. It's hard to, when you get off work or whatever you do, study two, three hours. Yeah, it was, but I had to do it. But some people need the structure of, okay, hey, you paid this money. We got this coming up every week. This is what we're going to be working on. They need that, that outline, that curriculum. A lot of people need that roadmap to stay on. Like, think about it. You know, you need your GPS to make it to your, your new destination. Yeah. So some people need that. And they're complaining. But when they, if we you know micro, macroeconomics, right, this is the small part. So this is the boot camp. I'm going to say boot camp is $10,000. And that's whatever, one year. Now, let's say you are 20 years old, 25 years old. Now, you got another 30, 40 years where you're 65, and that same $10,000 possibly helped you increase your salary 50, 60, 70, $100,000. So when you look at it like that, take a step away, did you get your return on the investment eventually? Uh, Yeah, if it came directly f- from what you paid for, but, though. But sometimes it's not. Like, even... Think about it. Some when it comes to school, people are say, "Oh, school is a scam. School is a scam." Possibly, but guess what? When I talk to recruiters and I tell them what type of money I want to make, and they start, "Okay, you've been doing this ten years. You got this and that. You got your masters. Oh, cool. You'll probably fit in this band." So sure, you can say it's a scam. However, on the, the long run, is you credentialed up so you can ask for certain money. On top of if you interview well, you'll possibly come in at a certain level. Yeah, I say get your credentials. Um, but if you can find work, if you can get a so-called entry-level role where an organization would pay for your schooling. I'm not, I get that, but take off about who's paying for I'm just saying in general, whatever money is spent, the investment you would get out of it. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Like, whether you pay, like, because you have people that's paid six figures in their education, and some people got their, got their return on investment and some didn't. But that's only because they chose the wrong thing. I think that's the issue. If you choose a major that is a major that eventually will make money, you're doing the right thing. Now, I would say if you can probably try to find a more efficient way to do the degree program for like less cost, like you say, going to a company that's going to pay for it. At least they pay half or something like that, getting you a couple of grants. That's cool. But eventually you're going to get that that return on investment back. So sometimes, like they say, scared money don't make no money. Yeah. Are people on on this level always complain about price, but then you got entrepreneurs that pay these business coaches way more money than what we would charge a regular person to take their business to the next level, and so they can get so they went from two k months to twenty k months, thirty k months, based on some principles that they spent probably ten thousand dollars on. But everybody don't see it like that. They just see, oh, you want five thousand dollars? Yeah, because what you're gonna get out of this is gonna be a great return on investment. If I got people paying me $500, $700, and then after working with me, they salary go about $25,000, $30,000, $40,000, $50,000. You do the math. I would say I'm not charging enough. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, or even if we yeah. if we even take off you land a job, I've had people where if they're making $50,000, I do their resume. They go in, I'm interviewing for a job making ninety, dollars $100,000. Really, my, my job is technically done because you weren't getting them interviews until you got with me. So now if you knock it out the park, like, dang, I spent 500. I'm making, I got $50,000 increase. <laughs> yeah. It's really like, nice. people don't look at it like that though. They just look at what it costs. Yeah, that's, that's some valid points. I think that's a, um, <clears throat> that's the same percentage that the boot camps use if you um, land a job in the program. So example me, I just take myself. I, um, Landed a job while I was in the boot camp, but it was no avail to the boot camp because I'm the one who applied and I'm the one who started, you know, learning the information at home to actually land a job. So I, I me, what me being in the boot camp wasn't necessarily the reason why I got the job. It was me what I was learning and actually applying it to why I got the job. But also, what happens is at the end, like they they call you or whatever they see. All the people went to the program. Have you landed something? No matter what it is, if you went to a boot camp for for cyber, but you landed a, a job in a mall, 
doing Come nothing. Come on now. Nah. No, no, listen, listen. This, this is true. This is real. No, it's not. This is it real. Is if not. you landed a job, something that's not even related to the boot camp, they marked it as no, they, they do not. They marked it as, oh, that's how, that's a percent of somebody landing a job because nah. it's a time frame they have. Nah, I would not. I do not believe that. Hey. Why would you? Who, show me proof. I'm telling you that, hey. No, nah, show me. Show you. Yeah. These are just inside of knowledge. Of course, they ain't going to put, the put that out there. Hey, what, Trump, you say fake news? Hey, okay. That's what I'm saying. Show us. You can show you the conversation I had. Like, it's like me showing you that we talking right now, if it's not recorded. I don't believe it. Well, men, men lie, women lie, numbers don't. Well, hey, they numbers say 70% of our... Because that's BS. And that, you know what's funny, though? That's something that... um. Or seventy five percent of our people graduate and get jobs and whatever, but then you see a lot of people go to maybe the same boot camp. Uh, I won't go put one name out there, but you know, there's one particular one that says, "Hey, all you need to do is come to my ninety day course. You become a subject matter expert on how to audit for payment card industry stuff." And, I don't know. Uh, I don't think and they, they say hey, ninety days. Hey, that's what this program say. 90 days, you good. But, hey, and then they say, well, whatever percentage of people gets these jobs, but then we see a lot of people who went through that same course complaining about it, never got no job, just say they wasted 15 k plus dollars, and it's just. But I'm also going to say, because I used to be of that mindset, but now I'm also realizing it's some people Cause I know this from being a coach. I got people that's go that's gonna be go getters. They gonna do them. They gonna land something. Then I got the people that I'm have to keep on following up with. What you working on? What you doing? This and that. So I do know in these boot camps, you got the people that's on it and they doing what they supposed to do. Like a person like you in your ACI course, you got the people that's paying their money, but they not really into it like they should. So of course yeah. they not gonna be successful. So it's one of the things is like we can make a case for either or. I, I put it like that. I would also say for programs like that, that's a really niche specialty. You should probably want to have some type of experience first. Well, they advertise you don't need no experience. All it you need is the knowledge. Yeah, it wasn't always like that. It <laughs> that's, changed. That's where it's coming but at. That's too. why I like my guy. Shout out to uh, Broadus. When we talked, I believe on our episode we talked about that, and he's gay. He was like, "Nah, like I, he, I forgot what he said. They percentage is, but like anybody probably saying like a percentage is like X amount. That's like too high. It's like just impossible to do certain percentages when it comes to guarantee and stuff. It's just hard because you got people." That drop out, life, everything else is just hard to do. So, yep. Now, let's on. let's get you started on these recruiters, oh, or yeah. let's get you started on these interviews, man. Like <laughs> he be hot, yeah, man. Cause the interviews that I say that was a great experience. I once is actually asking you what do you know and applying it directly to what they need. Now, when you have all these, you know come to a drill down types of interviews. What is this versus this? Someone would say, well, yeah, you should probably know that. But at the same time, it's not, like you said, it doesn't gauge whether you can do the job. It's just seeing if you memorize come teals or whatever vendor's concepts on how technology is supposed to work. Yeah, if you memorize 50 ports doesn't mean you're a good stock analyst. So why are we even wasting time going through this? Right. right, I had. I think remember I was telling you about the the interview my client went through with a company I used to work at, and how first of all the interviewer was trash. He didn't even acknowledge him. Like when he was saying, "Hey, well, how you doing?" Yeah, kept on ignoring him, and all he did was ask for stuff from Google, and not even trying to get him to not be nervous. The, and that's what things I talk about. It's like just as much as you want a good applicant, you need people that know how to interview and have empathy and soft skills. That can actually kind of get somebody there. Cause you might have a great candidate up there, but he nervous. Everybody don't test well. Everybody get shy to talk. Some people don't want to be on camera. Some people get anxious when they like people look at them. They don't know what you're going to ask. Like I think of, I went through a process to where they had a full itinerary of each interview and what each interview was going to be on. Every company should implement something like that because preparing for an interview is tough. You think like you're trying to prepare for all these different things or whatever they're going to ask you. And it's like, I don't know what to prepare for. Well, entry level people don't because their job is going to be a little bit different. Yeah. If you get a little bit more senior and you kind of know what the role is, nine times I think you should did enough stuff that goes directly into that, and it shouldn't really be any deviations in the interview process unless somebody's just trying to give you a hard time because they don't want you to get you get the job, which we see happening a lot. Yep. 
And I already know. So how you feel about this? I always tell clients, hey, don't it's not over till it's over until you get a sign offer, until you get maybe even the first check, till you get equipment. It ain't it ain't over till it's over. How you feel about about that? Like either somebody's telling you, you do good or you got an unofficial offer. Or I used to ask the question like, hey, is there anything about my skill set that you know confident I can do the job? Yada yada yada. And then a lot of times I say, no, I'm push you to the next round. You hear this stuff? I got it on. Ca- I mean, recording. So thinking, okay, cool. I'm, I'm probably about to get the offer on the next round. Never hit nothing back, and then you kind of yeah. chase down the recruiter. Oh, they went with somebody else. Like, okay, they could have told me that. Exactly. <laughs> the same stuff they asking us to have communication skills and being open and you know being a team collaborator it doesn't seem to get reciprocated a lot to people. So um, how I feel about it is, yes, it's a uh, it's annoying at best. But the interview questions. Oh, oh yeah. So you said how you asked the question of, is there anything about my skills that like I don't ask that anymore. I yeah, good. Because so people were saying that well, that's not a good question to ask. I'm like, why? Well, you already if you done already went through the interview, you probably already done whatever you done said is already said. Like it's nothing else to go back. I would disagree. About. There's been times where I've asked that and they were saying, I think you was a little, I'm not covered in your ability of this when you answered this. And then I've reiterated different things to kind of strengthen my argument to certain things. So I'll disagree about like whatever you said. Cause sometimes maybe you just didn't explain what you need to explain in the right way. But I just don't ask it anymore. Cause I actually just don't want to put the thought process in their mind. Yeah. It's one of the things I was looking at when they was like, Oh, how to prepare for the Amazon interview. And so it was like, don't ask that. Cause you know, and some companies let you know, hey, don't send us no thank yous because what you send us don't matter no way. So that's that whole thing right there. Like, how you feel about thank you letters? Um, thank you for the interview type of things? No, I haven't. I haven't really done those. I may have that a follow-up, like, if it's going on two weeks, I haven't heard anything. Hey, is there anything? So you never said, hey, uh, Paul, like a, thanks for interviewing me. I like this job. And yeah, I really said doing the interview. I'm like, thanks for taking the time out to meet with me today. Um, I know you, that, but I'm saying you never saying like, you know how people summarize a meeting you had? They had summarized a meeting to send it to everybody. You ain't never summarized like your interview and sent it to the recruiter? Um, summarize the interview. I mean, I say what we talked about, I think it went well or it. There were some questions that, you know, threw me off a little bit, but. Really? Do you, so do you take notes during your interview? Um, I record them now, and then I go back and write the questions out. Yeah, but I'm asking, do you take notes? During the interview? Yeah. Because I know because I never see how that was perceived. Like, if you writing down things, they may think you're trying to cheat or something. No, they're not. No. So. Bro, that, that, this one small tip has always helped my clients. I say, let them know, hey, like, you see me looking down, I'm just taking notes as well. Yeah, see, exactly. Like, I told you about the first interview I had with Evo. He said, hey, people looking down, looking around because they was Googling stuff. But no, that's different. You can tell when somebody's typing the Googling versus somebody's writing notes. You can, you can, it's a difference. Because if I'm writing notes, I'm going to look straight down. I'm not looking left and, and, and stalling. I'm taking notes on what you're saying. But that what that does is it shows them you can't prepare to interview just like they prepare to interview you. So you stand out. It's something small, but you stand out. You yeah, should try doing it. For, for camera interviews. Um, Any interview, even in person. I, I don't see a whole lot of in person. Well, I can, well, it's not probably in that one. I can show you so many things I've, I've written down, different interviews and dates. It just helped. Yeah. I mean, I got some. Because the questions, like, for example, so how do you, when you say you're knocking these interviews at the park, like, what questions have you been asking? When I ask them, I ask them what their, um, like when a person just is new to the role or new to the company, what their first quarter look like, what are some achievable things that people have, what are some projects that they're currently working on, what are some common issues that they come across, uh, how they're experiencing the company, how do they like it, and the best opportunities they, they were presented with, uh, learning opportunities, uh, what are the training opportunities that you all have for you know, career progression, Um what does that look like? How how long does people stay currently? Uh, what is the tenure for this type of role? What type of roles people move on to if it's within the company? I ask a lot of stuff. So, I'm going to tell you two good ones that I recently came across. One of them is, what's the most challenging thing about working here? That's where you get an honest answer for that to actually tell you. Yeah, when I ask them how, what the hardest thing they have 
project they worked on type of thing. So it's still a separate thing. Like that's a project, but this was actually just asking about company culture and oh, how they feel about it. Yeah. Well. And then the other one is like, hey, you know, what separates your successful employees versus the unsuccessful one? So it's just some, I promise you, like now it's like preparation. Like think about it. Everybody that played basketball, football in the league, whatever, they everybody good, everybody athletic. But now we're saying who prepared the best? Yeah. Who know when this guard lift this leg up that they pulling to do a sweep? Mm-hmm. Who recognized that? Say, okay, when you see that come, come down to the box and get ready to blow up this uh, sweep man. So it's like it, that's what it gets you now when you're preparing for roles you really like, going through the company values, researching those, getting your star questions together so you can ask them to that. So that's when it become more of a outside of the I know everything to, okay, how am I going to make sure I nail this and I knock it out the park? That's that's kind of what it goes to, and that's why I'm always on you. Like, well, I want to hear what you said, because it got to be some disconnects. Like, if you was that good, it could be one of two things: they already found somebody, or you didn't do as good as you thought you did. Well, hey, I can tell you, like I said, one of my recent interviews was just covering what is search versus experience. How did I feel about that? <laughs> I know, and that was a thirty minute talk. I know that, had, just like we're doing but right still, now. An outside person is able to look at that and like, maybe you're right, or maybe you won't. Maybe they ask you this, and maybe it's something you didn't catch on. Oh, too. Because sometimes when you interview you in the moment, it's like, dang. Like, I, that the interview I did for the fame company, right after I listened, I went back and uh, listened to it. I was like, I shouldn't have said that. That's a horrible example. Are we giving out specific examples type of thing? No, it was just, it was a star question that I didn't prepare for as far as, like, how did I, I think it was like, how do you handle, like, working with a teammate that got an issue or some type of crap that I didn't really or handle bad news. Some some crap that I didn't prepare for. You know what? Speaking of that star method thing, so I think he brought up Amazon. And um, it was this guy who's like, he calls himself, it's, it's something they call themselves when they are in the interview panel. I forgot, they call themselves something. But uh, he's a some razor, some type of whatever they call themselves. But whatever, he's been a software engineer and interviewer for like 15 years. He says now going through Amazon interviews, you might as well get the star method and throw it out. It's, it's not applicable. I'm like, that's the first time I heard of that. It's definitely not true. That's the first time I heard of that. He said, no, what they what they call the method, the best method is, is something they say it's called man in the hole. So basically this shows how you can, you have a deep rooted problem that you're very deep into and you talk about all those issues and you talk about each step that you've taken to get out of that hole and make it a better situation in general. I would totally disagree because their main thing is their principles. Yeah, so he talked about the principle. He was just saying how you outsing with your star method. You might as well. I, I can show you <laughs> uh, later on, but I was like. Their, main, their biggest thing really is like they're going to ask you something about the core values. And then they may, if now if it had to be something that's outside of the uh, a soft skill question, that's when you can probably use that man in the hole type. Yeah, of, if one of the soft skill. He was talking about yeah. for like technical questions, yeah. you can use that type of. Yeah, of course, that's different. Who wouldn't want to go in deep and like go into detail or Flesh something out. Because he answered in a star method. And it took, and I think it took like a minute and a half to get through that response. He yeah, said now. It took a minute or two. But he said he answered with the man in the hole method. It took him like two plus minutes, almost three minutes. So him just talking about the problem and right. actions taken. And I'm like, it's a lot of stuff to talk about. Yeah. And let so. me see. Because me and you always, like, what else we get on about? Oh, this is a good one. Me and you. Now, our friend here wants wants a certain amount. Well, really, no, this is the thing. He wants to do a certain type of role, and I'm telling him what I see him as, at least right now, just because I think he's very good at that. But he wants to do the other one. I'm not saying I don't know why. I think he just wants to do it because it interests him. And I've talked to him plenty of times about how, right here. how I feel like how you value your skills more than the other companies do. And that's one of the things, too, I think people run into. What they want. They're like holding out on maybe certain jobs because they're trying to get something else. And sometimes the market doesn't dictate that unless you got a certain skill set in doing it. And it's a hard thing. It's like, well, how do I get the skill set in doing it? when I want to do it, but I also want to get paid this. It's like, it's that thing right there that I'm always talking to you about. And you'll be like, well, I ain't doing that. I'll take this. I don't want to look at this all day. And I'm like, well, sometimes you got to see something as a little, a lily pad and hop to hop over to the other side sometimes. And I don't, sometimes you don't be willing to do that. You just real gung ho on what you want to do. Yeah. Because I think you can be easily swayed if you forget where you 
what your end goal is, but that's just me. Some people say, hey, I'll do this. But I'm at a point to where I want to just do something that I actually enjoy doing. I think you enjoy doing what you do I now. I enjoy what do what I'm doing now. And I also have interest in other things as well. So it's like if I have to go into something that I don't think I would like doing, I wouldn't probably I wouldn't make myself unhappy just to go to the end. I just try to work around it with what I currently have. I told until you my how time to. until my time comes. I told you how to. Yeah. Doing something I probably don't like doing. No, that's not what I told you to do. I said stick with what you're doing now and then set up your own thing when you're doing red team stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's literally how you do it. Oh, well, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean. That's the cheat code. Like, two jobs instead of just trying to force your way interviewing. Like, you can just show them, hey, I did all this stuff. It's documented all these different, what's it called? Like, go get your PNPT. <laughs> that's on that's in the that's in the works. I like that certification. I think that's a pretty cool one. I think it's going to give you a, a good observation. I've already got the voucher for it. I just, now I'm done with the school and stuff. I can focus on it. Yeah. But man, we we going down to the end. So I want to know like what a man from Memphis would tell the listeners. What a man from Memphis. About what? Anything, a, man. Anything. Well, do your research before you spend 20K on a boot camp. As you do anything else. Um... And no wing stop does not have the best wings. <laughs> Nobody said they had the best wings. Uh, uh, some people, some people I know. I said wing stop is good. I didn't um, say they got the best wings. Well, if it's still all consider, flats, if it's still if it's still considered good, then maybe you're lacking in diversitized chicken. He's just trying to make up. So he said diversitized. Yeah, you got to have some different types of wings, man. Memphis That's not wing. the only type of wings we brought up, though. What other types of wings? Any place that you can go that got some good mice, you know who got some good wings? Buffalo Wild Wings. Let me tell you. Say no. that. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm say if you told if you tell Bro, me those I, are good, I know something is up. No, no, no. Because uh wing stops are run like franchises, so everyone don't even cook the same. It's not like Buffalo Wild Wings. But uh Top Golf got some good wings and you wouldn't even know it. Well, yeah, because I hardly ever go there, but But yeah. Maybe you uh, can go there today. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Pins. You close enough to it. But yeah, um, what, what else? What else you want to leave them with, man? Um, you want them to follow you anywhere? Well, <laughs> yeah, you can uh, follow me on LinkedIn. I also have my own podcast. I'll talk about more issues into uh, getting into tech, talking to different uh, aspects, uh, different uh, minded people who have different aspects on how to get into tech. On my uh, YouTube channel, I got it called The Clay Talk Show. That's this guy I like to bring up a lot. But uh, that's where I'm at LinkedIn. I guess he can leave a link down there below. Um, I'm getting back on my channel soon since I'm done with a lot of extracurricular activities now. And that's all I have. What about, uh, can they follow you on IG? Man, I'm not on every social media platform. I already tagged you, so you on IG. I mean, I'm on IG, but I'm not on IG. I think we're going we're gonna to force them to make a TikTok. Um, I'm not. We're going to force them to make a Twitter. I'm not on these plat. I don't. I'm gonna force him to make a tweet. It's too much. He's to so manage. country, man. He's, it's too much to manage. It's really not. I post and get off. It's not too much. To it's too I much. People get on them things and start scrolling for hours. No, something. they don't. Not on Twitter. More like TikTok than Twitter. But yeah, that's where I'm at so far. LinkedIn and uh, my YouTube channel. That's about it. I appreciate y'all for tuning in today. Yeah. Y'all tune into the Clay Talk Show. I'll give him an appearance one day. He'll be back on here eventually, maybe going live, and we'll bring up some more stuff we get into it over about because it'd be hilarious when he be talking on the phone. <laughs> but um, yeah, if y'all want to see this episode early, like even though y'all at the end of the episode, please subscribe to the Patreon. Y'all can see everything, no skips, no ads, except maybe the ones I integrate into the pod. But like I always say, it's your boy HD. Stay textual, and we out.